Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 506. That's 506 of the Agostino Zinger Show. Hope you're doing well wherever you are. It's I, your illustrious host, Agostino Zinger. How am I? You know how I'm doing. The same as always, the same as always. Keep trucking on, keep steaming forward, one foot in front of the other, trying to balance as many places as I can to give my empty life a little bit of purpose. <laughs> If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below with all your thoughts, feelings, and suggestions. I'd be greatly appreciated to hear them. If you listen via the podcast app, please leave me a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 star review. Anything along those lines, I'd be greatly appreciated of that as well because, you know, those little reviews, they help the show to get up the algorithm, help to let it spread organically, and all that good stuff. And of course, support for your patrons. Welcome to our patreon.com. For just Agostino, you'll be able to find bonus content on there for my patron subscribers only uploaded every other week or sometimes every week so make sure you jump on there for bonus content don't delay today but yeah what's up man what's up my friends and family hope you're good wherever this may meet you i'm doing fairly fine thank you for asking as i said at the top of the show you know one point for the other and hanging out doing my vibe drinking iced coffees which i've been making a lot of these days to keep me going you know get just yeah trying to make the best i can of the time i've available it's a madness um life is quite empty right now because it's international football week so you know all these all these dumb tournaments that no one really cares about there's world cup qualifiers going on there's united there's you know nations leagues and shit just stuff that they're inventing in order to kind of squeeze more money out of flipping football fans and essentially work football is down to the bone and it it is what it is, I guess, but I'm mostly looking forward to everybody coming back so we can re um, we can kind of commence our our league season. Obviously, interesting developments going on in Newcastle and their uh, takeover. Then there's obviously stuff with, that, with United happening. Now that we've got the news that Harry Maguire and Rafa Varane are both going to be out. Maguire was out already prior, but now Varane's out because he got injured in the final against Spain, trying to cover for a defender, you know, illustrating his kind of, or showcasing his kind of blistering pace to cover his man. And then he ends up pulling up injured. Just our luck. But, you know, we shouldn't fret. We've got flipping Phil Jones in the wings waiting to partner either one of Eric Bailly and Victor Lindelof hopefully it's not flipping Phil Jones and Eric Bayer together because that's a proper diabolical pairing if I've ever seen one but most likely we'll definitely see Phil Jones appearing again especially when you consider all the flipping stupid PR that was given to him I didn't really understand too you're a football player um, he's been unable to play due to injuries and just just being not with that good enough really to kind of command the spot or to be you know worthy of people trying to make him or worthy of anybody trying to give him a chance and throw him out there and see if it works um, in that time he somehow survived what four managers I think he was signed by Cyrus Ferguson um, that's David Moyes Van Gaal, Mourinho and now Oli Solskjaer he's survived four managed five managers isn't it? David Moyes Van Gaal, Mourinho, Oli Solskjaer. He survived, you know, yeah, and he was signed by Alex Ferguson. So he survived basically four and a half managers. It's flipping insane to think about it. And you kind of realise how how flipping average he is. But for whatever reason, the UK media decided he needed redemption. So they spun this crazy PR story about him, you know, bullies online and trolls and shit. And him having a comment about, oh, he, he's going to achieve more in his shit career than most people will achieve in their whole lives. All this nonsense. But the, 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 the case remains, right? He's an injured player who hasn't played, I don't think, a full 90 minutes for Manchester United, maybe two and a half years or something crazy like that. And somehow he still gets to keep his first team number, right, in number four. I think supposedly the story goes he was unwilling to give that up to Rafael Varane, considering his flipping profile and reputation. That's incredibly arrogant. But again, I think he's allowed that. I do believe if you're a footballer or you're an athlete of any ilk, you are allowed to be somewhat delusional. Um, because that's the only real way you're going to convince yourself that you're going to beat the next man or woman in it um, especially if they train as well as you do they work as hard as you do um, what's to give you any right what kind of entitles you to win or what kind of entitles you to kind of think you're going to perform at your best so the only way to give yourself an extra edge is to really tell yourself no I am the best I am the one I am the shit all this good stuff I can beat anyone in a day I'm not giving my numbers um, to this Rafa around character because I think I'm better than him but as a fan looking on the inside, looking from the outside, sorry, it just comes across a bit weird, isn't it? Like, what the hell is this guy doing? How is he not going to give up his number if he hasn't played football for us for two and a half years? 
But you know, I digress. You know, I don't get the football chat. It's been boring all that shit. What else I've been up to? Um, I've been running. Obviously, I'm running. I'm getting myself into prime Berlin shape. I've been going to Berlin in a few weeks, so I'm gonna get myself in prime Berlin Berghain shape. So I want to start getting my endurance up. So I've started running again. I'm doing this whole week running. The plan is to run three times a week. I'm gonna run on Wednesday, run on Friday, and then kind of what the next week I'm then gonna include my weight training. So I'm gonna do my running Monday, Wednesday, first Friday, and then do training as in like push ups. So as in like yeah, basically push ups, sit ups, squats, um, back squats, deadlifts, and overhead press and bench press on the tuesday thursday and saturday so it'll be a six week training cycle happening from next week but this week i'm just starting with the running just get my base where it needs to be my cardio is pretty shit um i ran at night because my form is horrible and I'm, i look disgusting now because i haven't run in ages um not to that level i've been doing 200 meter sprint repeats here and there but they're easy to do really to kind of hold your pace and hold your tempo and be able to keep a steady flow of kind of air coming into your body whilst you're trying to run miles and miles is very difficult the first time i did it on the monday i managed to do three miles just under 5k in 29 minutes 29 minutes and a half just under 30 minutes which i'm really happy about but you know my all-time best in the 5k has been like 27 26 minutes so i've still got a way to go to get that level but again i was far lighter in terms of weight i'm still carrying about 50 pounds 60 pounds over yeah no let's say 50 to 40 pounds yeah because i'm 260 so i guess i want to get to about 220 by the end of the year i think that's um, achievable um again it's not that many months left but i think i could achieve that i'm about 260 now at the moment so i'm trying to get down to two four yeah 220 by the end of the month or sorry by the end of the year i started off this beginning of this pandemic at like 280 290 so i've lost quite a bit of weight i still need to I still have some ways to go at the moment i'm doing a lot of intermittent fasting so that's really helping i'm doing like a 20 what am i doing is it a 2021 cycle um using this app called zero i'm doing a one program i do no i'm doing a 20 year 2024 cycle so you eat within a four hour window then you fast for 20 hours there's loads of different kind of cycles you could do you could do basically 16 8 which is 16 hours fasting eight hours eating 18 6 um 20 24 which i'm doing for a six hour fast and longer than that but usually i kind of go between 18 6 and 2024 those are usually the times i like um that kind of suit me best i'm not really I find it easy to fast to be completely honest because I'm not a big foodie um even though I'm a bigger dude you would imagine I was a big food not really I'm a bigger dude because I eat shit I eat fucking processed food and things that come in cardboard boxes you know make my flipping dick hard sometimes so that really fucks me up but I'm not a foodie and like I gorge a lot of food and go out to eat places and whatnot I just order too many um uber eats and whatever whatever it may be and you know eat loads of flipping pastries when I go to the shops to pop in to go buy a couple of eggs I'll leave with a flipping whole rack of you know hot hot buns or whatever you know or sticky fingers you know what I mean that kind of guy so because of that i'm also lucky because even though i've got a bit of a sweet tooth i'm also lucky that i'm not a foodie so when it comes to time restricted eating i can do it pretty easily because i'm not really i don't i mean once i get into my flow i'm all right i'm not really i'm not the kind of guy that craves pasta or craves rice there's another thing as well i'm really lucky about um because i've been i fluctuate in weight i've kind of got i've got skinny got fat got skinny got fat obviously getting fat but again it's all for processed food and i'm really lucky really really fortunate that i'm not the biggest pasta or rice guy which is again weird considering that you know my background but I've been really lucky in that regard because I can't imagine how I would be if I if I just loved you know some people love pasta just love the pasta with some butter olive oil or a bit of cheese on top you know what I mean like they just love that classic shit and then they can eat flipping you know bowls and bowls of it I'm I, again I can eat pasta don't get me wrong I'm not going to spit it out um I can have a tortellini of course but I'm not really craving it I don't go to shops and buy it I don't really care too tough about it it is what it is it kind of just you know I don't really mind so when it comes to fasting I'm, I can do it pretty easily and I've found so far for me when it comes to fasting especially just Monday to Friday even if you don't do it for the whole week I think Monday to Friday is super good in terms of giving you a good base and generally I found that I lost I lost a lot more weight doing it that way and doing cardio and working out than I did doing any other thing kind of like eating whenever I wanted to obviously beforehand I still had like a little bit of a strict way of eating where I'd kind of make sure I'd eat a certain amount or I'd only eat certain things and then I'd only, you know, stop eating at a certain time as well. Like I would eat after like 6 or 7 p.m. Those things help. But this sort of fasting I'm doing at the moment where I'm basically going to, next time I'm going to eat is like 3 p.m. the next day. Um, It does kind of push you. It does kind of, you know, ask a lot of questions of yourself. But once you get over, I guess, for me personally, once you get over like the kind of day free, like if you start on a Monday, once you get past Wednesday, you're fine. Because your brain will make it tells you, 
you know, there's no point of tucking into something to break your fast early on the Thursday because you're going to be able to eat what you want after on Friday, right? Do you know what I mean? So it's just, there's no point. So as long as you get over the Thursday, Wednesday, you're fine. Then usually I'd like to kick in again on the Sunday. I find that if I roll over, if I do like a double kind of cheat day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I find that sometimes I don't kind of pick up again on a Monday. I pick up again on a Tuesday or the Wednesday. So I usually I just start again on a Sunday just to kind of get the ball rolling ahead of time. So that's usually what I'm, I'm doing at the moment. So the running's been difficult. I'm not going to lie, man. I've, I've mentioned this podcast so many times, but running is legitimately easiest so it's legitimately the hardest thing. I've, again, this is coming from somebody that's trained twice a day. I've done twice a days or two a days, two times per week, which means going to the gym twice, going in the morning, going in the evening. And I don't care what anyone says, running three times a week, um, more than three times a week is way difficult than doing anything in the gym when it comes to weight training and stuff. I guess because you're stationary and there is some sort of like weird gratific gratification about knowing that, oh, when I started this, I could lift that weight and now I can lift this weight, right? There's something intrinsic in your brain that keeps you going and it's easier to kind of slog through it. But when it comes to running, obviously you're running, so you can't slog through it. You kind of have to watch your step because you don't want to fall and crack your face open. And you're generally trying to push yourself. So that kind of gives you that, you know, edge that kind of that push or that yeah that kind of that push to kind of push to kind of uh, probe your cardiovascular levels right and your limits and shit especially if you're outside and you run past people you make you don't want to look shit so you try to kind of fix up your form and run a bit quicker then you end up kind of bleeding out your arsehole when you stop i know i've been there <laughs> but it's just in general it asks so many more questions of you to run especially when you're carrying extra weight it's legitimately one of the toughest things to do really really tough which is i which is why i understand people that are bigger don't really like to work out in general because you do know how you look you know you see yourself in a reflection of a shop window or a bus stop and you see how flipping gang you know how uncoordinated you are how wobbly you are how jiggly you are and it can get it can really kind of off put you but i found again in my experience from being a big dude and being a skinny guy and going up and down and fluctuating the only legit thing that really shifts the weight number one of course is the diet getting that in tune and number two doing loads of cardio i know there's a lot of people out there that can lose weight by doing just straight up weights right and you can do like um low weight high reps and that can obviously help you to kind of have some sort of cardiovascular burn but cardio without yeah weights without the combination of cardio in it is not going to shift your weight especially if you're looking to lose some in the beginning and then obviously maybe taper off and start to maybe firm up some of your flavia bits with some weight but in the initial weight loss bit has to come from diet and cardio it just has to there's no way to get around it and i've tried to do rowing machine which is again stationary and boring i've tried to do treadmill again which i think is stationary and boring i don't know how people do it people in my gym they actually go on a treadmill for like half an hour i don't get it man it's legitimately one of the most mind-numbingly boring things i've ever had to experience but the one thing that i've definitely have found to be beneficial is running on the street but again it's so difficult when you start again but you know i'm enjoying the challenge i want to get my time down my three mile time down to as much as i can closer to 28 27 minutes that'll be approaching what i was current what i was at, kind of at my quote-unquote best and then going forward do a few more uh, runs and then hopefully do a race at the end of the year to kind of cut things off and then by then I should be at my ideal weight which is like about 220 210 which is what I think I can kind of I can comfortably keep myself at for a lot of time being because again most of this weight came from COVID hanging around at home not doing much ordering loads of flipping Uber Eats I you know sometimes I do but twice in one week which is flipping gross to think about it but all of that indulgence has to kind of go away um, but it's really difficult of course to do especially nowadays where there's no commute from to work you're waking up and you're just working from home you know that kind of but again i, I love it in general because you're having to squeeze in the work class before to kind of make it make sense but it's, it's working out pretty well again so i'm looking forward to doing that so that's what i've been doing and then of course as i mentioned i'm going berlin hopefully in a few weeks that should be fun um really really looking forward to it the plan is to go to Berghain, of course the number one number one destination um there's been some really really conflicting and worrying stories about the queue times though i've heard people basically saying the standard time you have to wait is basically four hours unless you go right bang on you know 11 p.m on the saturday evening or something and wait you have to really go like you know you have to kind of wait four hours plus it just is what it is so the plan i might have to do because i'm gonna arrive a little bit earlier in the week is i might kind of try and get some partying in the partying out of the way on the thursday do a little bit of day drinking on the friday or evening drinking on a friday and then pop over to Berghain just before it's about to open maybe 10 p.m 11 p.m 
right so yeah maybe if i yeah i think i'm meant to arrive like a tuesday or something like that right so obviously have time to kind of hang around do my thing and then when it approaches a friday pop over there before 12 maybe 11 maybe half 10 queue up and then go have a boogie dance and then maybe get a stamp and then because but then the issue with the stamp coming back i've heard is that supposedly if it's at capacity they don't even let you back in so it's not a guarantee that if you leave you can come back in which is a big issue and again considering the distance really it doesn't really make any sense to leave and then come back in really and you, know, you should really just stay um so let's see what happens let's see because i've got to meet a few people too got a couple of friends out there that i want to kind of hang out with people that i've kind of known from london who have basically moved over there and found a new life um there was a time when i wanted to move over there myself but i think uh, as the years have progressed and i've become a little bit more mature and my kind of going out requirements have kind of less centered around drinking and doing loads of drugs i've kind of felt like you know i don't really need to go there i don't really need to live there i can visit at least once a year which i was doing before covid i would go at least once a year sometimes twice i'd go maybe um in usually it was around this time as well around the winter times for whatever reason i've only been once during the summer fucking beautiful um i really regret not going more often now i understand why everybody basically um loves to go during the summer the summers are gorgeous the winters are horrible um it's so so cold Old, but i've heard that supposedly this year has not been too bad so that should be pretty cool to look forward to but yeah the plan was always moved there but i've kind of I've kind of been put off it by now um it's a great city don't get me wrong but i don't really want to get lost in the source and it's not really necessary um for what i want to do i can still kind of hustle do my thing eventually maybe get booked out there to play in some places later in the future and kind of travel back and forth and then the ultimate goal would be of course to have a place out there and maybe rent it out or something do you know what i mean um it's a bit more difficult to do now obviously with us not being in the eu and some change is happening over there as i've fucking noticed on airbnb the accommodation in berlin has completely changed um as it was you know a few years ago like it's really really thin on the ground in terms of actual good places you can kind of um rent um for your trip i think they had some law change in terms of basically not allowing people who weren't if i'm not mistaken it's not if you're not a citizen or you're not registered in germany you basically or berlin wherever you can't rent out a place on airbnb because i think beforehand people were basically taking advantage of that loophole and basically you know um make it basically getting like a long lease on a place so not even owning it and then just subletting it or sub renting it or whatever that term is right to people um during you know and then kind of making loads of money that way and of course none of that money was funneling back into the german you know um economy loads of spaces and homes are basically occupied by people who are just tying them up in airbnb lots and people that live there couldn't actually get a hold of property because that's the one thing that's scarce in berlin right um properties people queue up and shit for interviews and you know you have to send flipping bios and answer questionnaires and play games and shit to win a spot to win a chance to rent a place is flipping it's like the it's like the apartment it's like the flat sharing version or flat hunting version of of the sneakers app do you know what i mean absolutely diabolical so that happens quite often over there so hopefully the plan again like i said um once the money starts rolling once i kind of start saving up in my other ventures that i'm kind of looking to explore go and need to go definitely end up getting a place out there but for now i really enjoy visiting you know it's an easy trip from london an hour and a half journey even with this new airport that they've got because i think they've closed the one that i usually go to which is um oh what's it called xcf or something that's that but it's changed now it's a new airport that they're meant to be built that's meant to be open for years ago but it's finally did open i think sometime at the beginning of last year so that should be pretty decent and even with that you know a train journey and i think all in all it's about two and a half hours door to door basically to leave here to go straight to berlin and kind of you know get in your main apartment which i usually get you know spaces in you know neuklon or prince lauberg or something like that in you know, somewhere central easy where i can kind of transcode i can kind of walk around to because i like to as well as, as good as the trains are over there and the tickets are fairly cheap i think it's like 16 euros or something for a week pass i do like to kind of walk around most places i go on holiday i like to kind of just you know get out there and just see wagwan explore the streets and whatnot sometimes it can be a bit too crazy because other times i don't know why it is maybe because i'm used to london streets but sometimes foreign map especially when you load up the maps of another country on your phone it can sometimes be deceptive you can think a place is nearer than what it actually is and you end up walking and you figure out, oh shit this is a half an hour walk this is an hour walk it's not 20 minutes not 10 minutes whereas everything in london's like 10 20 minutes away when you're looking at it from the map so that's usually a bit of a mind wobble in it but um the plan is again like i said to go to Bergheim on the Friday 
um, not on a Friday night, hopefully get a stamp, get a ticket, um, see the guys dance around, do the thing, hunt, 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 hunt. Um, and then of course, the other places I want to go check out is this place called Paloma, uh, Paloma Bar, which is in Copas Ator, right under kind of roundabout as well. I think it's a bit near the, if I'm not mistaken, it's near the Burgermeister, if I'm not mistaken, it's upstairs. So as you can see from the picture, there's like a river, river which is a supermarket. And then next to it on the left-hand side is a Burgermeister. Um, obviously the premier sort of like burger um, spot there in Berlin sort of similar to what we have here in terms of meat liquor and stuff and um, you know that sort of burger I think it's much nicer actually I think the meat's good and the bun's amazing and it's really good service and whatnot and they got cheesy fries so that's pretty nice so maybe I'll pop in there get something to eat then go to Paloma's which is kind of a housey disco-y type venue more so than a techno one I'd say it's yeah I'd say it's less techno and more so that kind of vibe it kind of reminds me a little bit of that place in um is it Munich? Um, is it Munich or Dortmund? Uh, the place called um, Salon de Amateurs, right? That place that they featured on a Resident Advisor a few years ago that everyone kind of raves about. I never had a chance to go, but it kind of reminds me of that, like a kind of cool loungy bar um, that obviously turns up later on in the night, so that should be cool. And it's got a cool entrance too. It's like a little mesh gate. You walk up some stairs, you know what I mean? Security guard there, whatnot. So that should be awesome. Um, going to go Palomas. And then the other place I went to go visit was this place called Wild Renate. Um, uh, but it's, it's listed as like Zur something else, but I'm not sure if it is. I think it's just called Wild Renate, but if you want to know it as. But it's a cool little space. It's kind of like got an indoor space. It's also got this weird outdoor space, kind of like in the, you know like an open air normally, which they have over there in Berlin. And then they have the DJ booth inside like a boat looking thing that's kind of in the middle. And the DJ sit down instead of standing up behind a booth. So it lends for a really interesting um, mix of people playing, um, a very eclectic choices of music, um, very interesting people in terms of performances. You can see here, there's loads of kind of, um, you know, crazy interesting and just kind of you know unconventional performances more so than just a dj playing right there's always something kind of going on visually that you can kind of feast your eyes on but i really like how the dj booth is set up it, it really is awesome this is a picture from a lady called dj boney s on instagram so it's going to show you i think this is for their night called was it female pleasure but let's just double check here i think there was a video here from of the dj booth actually yeah, there you go. so it's all like a boat thing right they put in the middle and you just play and they sit down vinyl or cdjs it's really cool man i'd love to play somewhere like this you basically have to play all day you know what i mean or you know mostly all day relaxed vibe people just drinking chilling hanging out having a bit of a good time having a boogie look at that look how cool that looks and you can ramp it up later on Not as, not as much black as you'd expect from like a techno club in like uh, Berlin. But again, I don't think it's a techno club, it's more free for you know I mean? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to going to there. A couple more pictures, a couple more videos of people hanging around. Oh yeah, this is a performance there, obviously. Look how cool this looks. I love these kind of things that they have in Berlin, man. it's really awesome. They really take their um, clubbing culture seriously. There, but yeah, look at that booth. That's fucking awesome, you know. That's a pretty sick booth, man. A little boat in the middle of a little open air. So definitely, that's going to be one place I'm going to check out. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that and seeing the performances. Um, you know, gathering it all in, taking it in with the eyes and all that malarkey. You know that good stuff. And then I'm also going to hopefully go to this venue called Same Heads, which is very kind of similar to a bar that we'd have here in london that we would have here in, here in london which is ironic considering that if i'm not mistaken the founders of same heads are brothers who are english who moved over to berlin years ago maybe in the early 2000s or whatnot and it's a very kind of multi what do you call how do you call it um multidiscipline or whatever it's kind of a very versatile space they have like fashion shows in here they film things in here live stream of course and then it's just like a classic club sort of vibe as well so i'm really looking forward to going there um it's really kind of weirdly um decorated loads of um, knickknacks everywhere um nothing kind of makes sense there is no rhyme or reason why things are where they are as you can see for the pictures here i'm showing you loads of interesting nights and as per usual with all these places in berlin there's not much of a lit oh this i think this guy on the left was on horror right i forgot his name he's a dj what's his name here 
uh, yeah, that's him. Love, that Love Fist Tears. I'm pretty sure I saw him play on the whore once. But yeah, um, the good thing about the one of the good things about these places as well is that there's no real kind of program you can kind of see ahead of time. I'm going to miss out on this festival, actually, I think. There's no real program you can see ahead of time. You're going to just have to wait. You kind of just, just go and just hope it's a good night. And usually def usually it is. You don't really have to kind of um, hope too much or get too, you know, worried about your nights out, which is something you can kind of, um, you know, it's something cool to kind of like keep off your mind so you're not having to worry about, oh, well, this person playing, have I got a ticket? Generally, if you kind of like the space and you want to go, just check it out. And usually it's going to be a pretty decent night. Let's see if I can find a video of somebody recorded recently. See what it looks like on the inside. Yep, it's from September 19th. Let's see this. This is from Kinzo Chrome. But look how fun that looks. A lot of Italo house here. Italo disco, sorry. It's a cool little small spot. Probably fits about 300 people maximum being there. Nice. I can't wait to go in there man i'm really fucking looking forward to going here so yeah i'm gonna go same heads and then lastly but not least the other piece of resistance my one of my most favorite bars and a bar that i've had a lot of kind of interesting experiences with uh, <laughs> members of the opposite sex in my time has been roses um this is definitely one of my favorite bars in berlin um I've just had some, again, like I said, some great memories at this place. It's essentially a gay queer bar, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, great interiors kind of laced with all this plush red velvet on the walls, weird little nooks, knickknacks everywhere, um, and just generally a great vibe. I don't think they have a DJ, just have somebody playing the playlist online or, you know, behind the bar. The bar is great, good drinks, all this good stuff, and people just get crazy. You know what I mean, as you can see via this picture, I don't want to get taken off on my YouTube, but you can see people just get nuts, they get loose, they enjoy themselves, they get sparkly, and again, it's a it's a refreshing sort of uh, rest. It's a refreshing sort of respite from the dreary blackness of most of the techno clubs that obviously reside in Berlin. Number one being Bergheim, Germany. You only have to look at the queue at the Bergheim to see how many people arrive there wearing exactly all black, exactly the same outfit, exactly the same faces, exactly the same earplugs. So it's quite refreshing to see a very bright, sparkly lit kind of club um, that doesn't necessarily play the same music as every other venue. So I'm a big fan of it. So I really, really cannot wait to get back in there. Again, one of my favorite spots to go out there in Berlin if you're not really a fan of checking out most of the bird you know the techno techno -y kind of spaces I definitely recommend it again great drinks open till late if I'm not mistaken and just kind of a great vibe overall so that's the kind of venues that I'm going to be reaching when I visit Berlin in a few weeks and I honestly honestly I'm so excited the only thing again like I said I'm nervous about is just the wait time in Berlin I think I've told myself if I have to wait more than two and a half hours three hours I'm just going to leave and go somewhere else I love the place but it's not worth it to stay that long in the queue and obviously with the resource like like um there's an account what's it called in case you want to know as well if you want to go there's an account on instagram that basically uploads videos over the weekend of people sending in clips of what the queue looks like so you can kind of judge when you should go obviously you should make your own plans and not wait for somebody to upload something all right because obviously it might be too late but um let me see if i can find it bear with me one second da, 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 da. There we go, Bergheim. What is it called? It's called something. Yeah, it's what it's called. Um, Bergheim Line Live. Bergheim Line Live. It's all one word. Um, it's a really good account. Definitely make sure you follow it. They upload mostly on stories, never on the main feed, unless it's like an announcement thing. But um, usually they upload on the story, so obviously it disappears over time. So you know, there's no record of it and shit. I'm assuming, but definitely check it out. They upload all the you know people send them DMs of the queue and show them what the queue is like, so you can kind of find out what's going on. So those are my plans, man. I'm really really looking forward to it. As you can tell, I'm super excited and I'm training my else off to run loads so i can be fit enough to you know stay on the dance for hours and hours and to make sure that i can fit into my subies and my recommends you know you know the vibes you know the vibes anyway moving on what else do we need to talk about today let's move on so let's talk about club stuff right let's continue with the club topic this is courtesy of resident advisor pretty kind of you know um crazy news but also it does kind of reaffirm the things that i've been seeing out there in clubland and also maybe reaffirms um my 
sort of position or my sort of circumstances now when it comes to DJing and playing out in places and the fact that you know my bookings that I've had usually for the best part of what two years have completely dried up since everything has kind of reopened especially from the bars and pubs I used to play at I'm not really kind of done the whole big big nightclub things I've done a few warehouse spaces but for the most part at my level I'm still on that kind of bar pub sort of level and that whole scene has completely dried up and I think this might have something to do with it so this is an article this is a, a news piece courtesy of RA it says 86,000 UK nightlife jobs lost during the pandemic new report finds um, a new report shows that the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the UK nightlife industry commissioned by the Nighttime Industry Association which is the NTIA the report finds that 86,000 nightlife jobs have been lost since 2019 86,000 right mad isn't it um, the report also measures the economic value of the nightlife sector for the first time. The industry's contribution accounted for 425,000 jobs across the UK in 2018 and made up to 1.6% of national GDP or 36.4 billion in 2019. It's mad how the government just discarded the nighttime industry considering how much money it brings in, isn't it? That goes to show that in general, this government, especially the Tory government, just doesn't give a shit about nightlife, doesn't give a shit about fun things, doesn't give a shit about the youth. And just kind of, you know, wants to keep keeping on in it. It's just weird. The quote here says, after the 20, 2008 economic crisis, it was hospitality that led the recovery, driving other forms of job creation and economic activity. The nighttime economy was a big part of that, says the NTIA CEO, Michael Keel. The same can be true for the economic crisis. As you can continue to chart its recovery to pandemic, not left in a wait. Clarification on the possible introduction of vaccine passports. A recently introduced government-led insurance scheme will only be effective with severe conditions, such as the other, another lockdown in force. So yeah, everyone's kind of operating on a kind of hope basis. It looks like with the insurance thing, especially some festivals, maybe some festivals have been able to get you know emergency cover but everyone's just kind of running the risk of having their thing cancelled or you know being sued or whatnot so it's a lot of risk getting involved which is why a lot of promoters have basically encouraged customers to not try and cancel or not refund their orders or maybe pass a ticket on to somebody else or hold it for the next event whenever they're putting it on because there's so much money and so much at stake if these things kind of go under in terms of people's jobs and livelihoods but the 86,000 jobs that have never come back since the pandemic has kind of since the, the lockdown has kind of eased and people have been able to go back again is a illustration to me as to why I'm finding it difficult too to find gigs at my level because from what i've seen when i've gone out and the, cu the couple of gigs i have played in the bars and pubs that i've played prior to the pandemic it's definitely far quieter than it was before it was never always it was never packed don't get me wrong i'm not gonna command crowds like a you know ricardo Villa lobos or whatnot but it was a decent enough following that you would think okay cool people kind of had an idea that dj is going to be here tonight and they went to come out to have a dance have a drink when i went out that time to go play people that were there generally didn't even know i was going to be there had no idea didn't care and also it was rather empty and also the people that came just came specifically to have a drink and leave usually when i played beforehand they'd come to have a drink maybe they'd see me playing they'd hit like the stuff they'd be like oh yeah shit they maybe ask me what i'm gonna play later and then they maybe stay for a couple more do you know what i mean and that would be a good way to kind of hold the crowd get get you know get people maybe on the dance floor for the last hour or so it was good but now i've noticed for the most part it was absolutely dead by like 11 p.m i started at like nine my set it was already dead and i was just kind of you know going through the motions and just you know waiting to go home basically and, and get my uber eats on the way home as well or drip so by the time i get home it was already arrived and that was basically it and i think a lot of it has to do with people's appetite for going out changing i think a lot of it as well is kind of again we underestimate especially here in london i think people around europe have probably seen it too especially places like berlin um that as much as people scoffed at the tourists, especially we do a lot here, and I'm sure they do over there too, we kind of poo-poo the tourists and kind of bemoan the fact that they come and they take up our space and all that sort of shit. They really did account for a large majority of people filling up spaces or filling up nightclubs and also kind of keeping these places afloat. So without that kind of constant tourists kind of coming in in a weekly kind of monthly basis, it's no surprise that the jobs have dried up. And I'm assuming a lot of those people too might have been, you know, people who are originally from other places in Europe and maybe went back home to look after family or to just kind of unwind and maybe work over there remote working whatever or just again like I said a lot of my friends in my social group have kind of just moved on from clubbing all the time they don't go to clubs all the time they've kind of you know filled in their time with other things like going on holiday or going to restaurants or cocktail bars or just generally hanging out in homes now because we've had practice for the last two years two and a half years basically to figure out what we can do for fun that doesn't only include clubs and myself included I found myself kind of having a lot more fun outside um 
you know, that doesn't need to, outside of my home, that doesn't include going to a dark, dingy club somewhere. Don't get me wrong, I still love it. It's still a huge part of my lifestyle, but it's not the entirety of what I do on the weekend. So I'm sure other people are are the same too. So that's basically one of the reasons why I think, or a few of the reasons why I think that's kind of negative effect of the position that I'm in at the moment too. And just in general, this is not a good thing for the nighttime economy overall in the UK, because it means a lot of these places are basically hanging on by a thread because they can't get people to work. Um, A good example of it, again, like he's mentioned, it's a place, but it's a truth from what I've read so far is that Berghain allegedly it meant to be if I'm not mistaken the end set usually ends at around if I'm not mistaken like Monday afternoon or something I think maybe 3 p.m maybe sometime before 12 but because they've short-staffed and in general that's so I've heard anyway through the grapevine they're unable to open up later they're probably going to do that later on maybe in November when I go or whatnot um but they basically aren't able to open later on because they're short staff. And why they're short staff? Because again, the pandemic, people have kind of lost their jobs. They weren't able to be employed for a long time. So maybe they moved and pivoted to other careers. Maybe they just sacked off nightlife in general and went other places. Who knows? So even the place as established as well known as Berkheim is struggling to find staff. Imagine your local cocktail bar, your local restaurant, your local nightclub, your local snooker hall that kind of plays, sometimes plays music on the weekend. Those places are, you know, basically dead in the water. And again, it's really, really sad to see, man. This is definitely one of the long COVID effects. Yeah, yeah, long COVID effects that we're kind of suffering through and we're probably not going to see the end of until things return to actual normality. And right now, people are just kind of, you know, hoping it goes away, but it hasn't really gone away. Um, and then, of course, actually, to kind of before I continue, I want to kind of quickly give you guys a heads up as well in case you are interested. For those of you who live in England, specifically, I am going to be DJing for the first time outside of London. I think this is the first time. Where did I play before outside of London? I think I have before. Anyway, I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. Let's just say this is the first time outside of London um, for this great night called Club. Um, it's happening in Birmingham on the 27th of November at a club called Sook, um, Suki 10C from 10 p.m. until 4 a.m. Tickets are going to be available in the description. When I click this, you're going to be able to click the link in the description and buy a ticket. So make sure you go on down in the heart of Birmingham. I'll be playing, um, you know, during the night. Um, the light basically is centered around you know afro deep deep house sort of music so it's going to be stuff that i generally don't get to play out um but it's going to be nice to be able to play that outside on a loud system for a captive for a kind of a, a receptive crowd let's say that'll be a decent kind of turn up for the books and generally i'm just kind of excited to go back out there and play again and like i said it's been it's been a bit dry out there in terms of having gigs in london um you know with the pandemic and things changing and clubs maybe or bars realizing that maybe they don't need to have me play for four hours if they if no one's going to be there they can just basically put a spotify playlist on and occupy time that way it makes complete sense so the need for that is kind of gone on so maybe now um the difficulty now would be for me to kind of find these other gigs that are kind of a level above which kind of you know because they're in a club um it requires an entry fee um there's going to be other great djs they're playing too there's going to be a crowd that's going to be you know obviously of course receptive but also um eager to hear you play and want to be impressed on that kind of it's a bit more pressure on this than it would be in the places I usually play on the weekend. But again, you know, I've got enough experience under my belt, enough of a um, good taste level, I'd imagine, to kind of understand what the cl- what the kind of crowd would want so I can confident enough to put together a fairly decent um, set that should hopefully stand me in good set and have a few people tapping their feet and nodding their head. That's the only thing that I'm kind of looking forward to. And like I said, I'm just really, really grateful um, to have the opportunity to do so. And I'm really kind of looking forward to doing it again. It's going to be outside of London. So it's a chance to kind of travel a bit, get out, you know, see some different sights and sounds. And in general, I've have, I have a very interesting relationship with flipping um Birmingham anyway I think this might have been it might have been the first place I went to like a proper proper rave rave like in a warehouse and I think it might have been like a drum and bass rave I don't know what it was um I can't remember but it was around when I was like 21 maybe 20 right um that was on my first first proper drum and bass rave and it was absolutely mental i think i lost wallets i lost phones and i i think that was time when i used to i used to carry on an slr and take pictures from my blog um if you remember back in the day i had a blog called stop begging that I kind of like, used to upload all of my kind of adventures gallivanting around town pretending to be some sort of you know streetwear kid or whatnot so that was quite fun but yeah birmingham was a great time man i remember we stayed in some hotel that we ended up kicking getting kicked out of i remember one of the guys we were hanging out 
we've had a fight with some kid in some shopping mall that was something <laughs> mad um just a great time but i do remember it just being such a sketchy place it's one of the best it's one of if i think in general if you want to get a good reflection of what england is actually like london isn't it you should definitely go outside of it whether it's liverpool manchester birmingham um newcastle those are better reflections of what actual what people from england are actually like than london because people like to pose here and you know um keep up appearances but in places like birmingham people just show out i mean they are who they are there's loads of freaks and weirdos in the streets and again this is meant in the kindest way possible um so it definitely does kind of um call for a very interesting selection of people same thing happens when you go to like liverpool manchester you go out to a cocktail bar or in a club around those kind of areas and you could you could be standing right next to a couple of club kids a couple of streetwear supreme like lads a couple of skateboard kids and then a whole gaggle of like you know milfs like actual milfs like 40 plus year old women hanging around having a drink and you know wanting to eye up some younger guys it's just a complete melange whereas if you go to a club in london you're usually going to find people that look like you right generally over across the whole entire um, audience base no one's really gonna stick out really like a sore thumb but you see that a lot in those kind of places up north you know there's really like a really nice melange of people inside a club that kind of brings gives it a nice sort of different sort of atmosphere so i'm looking forward to that being a thing as well again with the genre of the music being afro deep there's a lot of range in terms of who would be interested in it again with the location it's interesting too um i think there's a picture here with the outside of it and what it looks like it's a really really cool location with all nice kind of art and and spray painting on the outside of the building so it's going to be a really really good way to be let's copy this caption from them club.uk again follow them on instagram it says we'll be hosting our next event suki uh, suki event at uh, suki 10c which is a unique music venue in digbeth birmingham the venue is committed to sustainability and it's decorated with street art mural celebrating the future of black icons and influences of music and culture tickets go on sale next week look out for early bird tickets before they're gone of course so definitely check it out you find the link again in the description so you can hang out as well have a good time maybe get a couple of pictures on the outside of the building to upload on your instagram and then come in for a boogie or two you know courtesy of the rest of the gang that i'll be playing so yeah definitely definitely looking forward to it definitely come down if you are that way inclined club um creators of afro deep house it's going to be a fun one 27th of november 10 p.m until 4 a.m again i'll further the link in the descriptions definitely make sure you hang out come out show out um i'll be getting sloshed and bosh after the set most likely um i like to start sets kind of sober so i know what i'm doing and then as soon as that set is over i'll be on the dance with everybody else you know punch in the air screaming and whistling and acting like an absolute loon because why not why not okay getting back to the show after that quick little advertisement break um <laughs> let's go on this one yeah this is news courtesy of resident advisor ibifa is open the clubs and ibifa get the green light but few will but few are reopen which is interesting i guess you know maybe um, the capacities aren't enough for them to kind of reopen and make it make sense. But let's read the article here, courtesy of RA. It says, Ibiza Cubs can reopen indoors as of this Friday, which was last week. The High Court of Justice of the Balearic Islands, the TSJB, has given the final green light for nightlife industry to sanctioning by sanctioning the use of COVID-19 passports for entry. Um, our other restrictions include 5 a.m. closing time, which is a bummer because part of the, I, I would imagine I've never been to Ibiza, but I guess part of the appeal would be to kind of see the sun rise in the morning. Um, leaving at 5 a.m. is too early for that to be a thing but i would imagine a lot of people in that beef are for after hours illegal some Ill, some illegal some legal but mostly illegal and if you've got a good place and you brought a couple of bluetooth speakers you could probably figure out a thing that you could do in your own hotel room or whatnot despite the good news most venues in ibifa haven't opened indoors since summer 2019 few will take advantage of the last minute ruling the main ones are amnesia which has closing which has a closing party planned october 28th 23rd sorry and dc10 which has announced three parties in october pasha is still considering reopening periodical the ibifa reports while Hi, Ushuai and Privilege have ruled it out. Interesting, isn't it? Last week, Jose Luis Benitez, the head of Leisure and Association of Ibiza, said on a local TV that it cost a super club up to 100,000 euros to reopen which makes sense why they're not reopening. This explains why so few are taking the risk. The other big reason is staffing shortages. See, again, staffing shortages from Bergheim not being able to open late because of staff shortages to the UK reporting there's like what? Um, 86,000 jobs lost since the start of the pandemic to now Ibiza. Like everywhere is facing shortages. It looks like people, it looks like 
another thing that I think is what happened a lot of people that's working in those service industry jobs especially in hospitality because they pay so shit if you go back home and you're working remotely and you're still getting paid not that well you could probably still make more money than you would make busting your ass in a club being a bar back picking up glasses serving people do you know what I mean you probably make still maybe the less maybe just a just a bit more and you stay at home right you see us at home or if you work in a supermarket local to your home you probably be able to make the same amount of money and it's you know it's kind of stable income you don't have to worry about your your kind of supermarket closing anytime soon so that probably is a reason why a lot of those low-paid jobs as long as soon as somebody gets something that can pay them something similar and maybe the hours are a bit more forgiving they're gonna go and not really turn back so that's the issue and i think it's it's mostly like a lot of retail when i was in retail when you work in retail and that's all you know you don't mind staying and hanging out but the moment you get a taste of working a quote-unquote earthless job especially if you're not if it's not your kind of um what's that called not your calling to be a retail person because again a lot i've got a lot of friends who have they've done their entire career in retail and now now you know kind of area managers and shit and got a lot of responsibility because it, it requires a certain type of temperament in the same way like a school teacher right not everyone can go and do it but the thing i think you realize the thing that's um disappointing or the thing that's hard for an employer is that once somebody has a little taste of what life is like outside of working hospitality is very difficult to get them back in. So I'd imagine this break um, during the pandemic has made people realize that, go for different things. And then when the world did reopen slightly and hospitality did reopen and clubs and restaurants did reopen and allow people to sit the back indoors, those very same people weren't really rushing to get back to their, rushing to get back to their former jobs because, you know, why would you? Especially if you live in a country that's, you know, you can get benefits from claim from the government. They might be able to pay you similar salary than what you was getting paid anyway to bust your ass and, you know, uh, in the restaurant waiting tables and shit so i definitely understand it and again the hundred thousand euros fee to reopen is just wild even for those bigger clubs especially the fact that they've had no income coming in where they're gonna find this money do you know what I mean to pay for it um the other big reason is staffing shortages brexit and the pandemic have left ibiza without the usual influx of workers from the uk spain and italy it's really hard to find staff says dan jesus says don hindle creative director of pikes the beefer rock sold resident advisor last month especially like kitchen service staff waiters and everything so so to actually be able to find staff to open a venue in october for a month i think it's impossible oh yeah true because it's only for a month it's short notice yeah no wonder they're not opening so the circle local and dc 10 of these places if you are going there be very thankful because it looks like not a lot of places are going to be able to make it make sense Pikes a cozy venue in a hotel near San Antonio has events in the diary for Friday onwards but Hindle and her team have used the pandemic as a way of rethinking the venue's offering focusing more on the restaurant and hotel as a venue we've got less staff we're open for less hours but you're probably taking the same man money oh true so actually it becomes a bit more sustainable as a business model oh true that's that kind of relates back to the Logan Paul podcast story they told a few weeks ago right i think one of the guys on there is it mike yeah mike the other guy with the dark hair he said they went to ib for recently they were i guess on a bit of a european tour and they were at some restaurant and i guess a lot of people have heard say this too because i think a lot of americans from the last few months have been going to ib for um just to, obviously i guess they mix things up because they always go to the same places all the time like Cabo and whatnot and dominican republic so they all went to ib for and they were talking about how weird it is to go to a kind of restaurant club sort of vibe in ib and have you know all these really attractive women who they were were later on led to believe or told that were all kind of you know high-end sort of escorts but basically what they were describing was that kind of loungy kind of restaurant -y kind of vibe right where there is a dj in the corner but it's not a nightclub in the convention sense with a big dance floor there's more tables in the very space for you to dance but it is that kind of cool, that kind of relaxed core cool vibe where they maybe stay open until 4 a.m or whatnot you can grab yourself a drink get something to eat maybe have a bit of a flirt and go back home as well as clubs a new ruling has extended to closing times in bars and other small venues to 4am social distancing a table service and a dancing ban however remain in place jesus christ so yeah 8, 11th october 18th october 25th october terrace may even garden duh, duh. and of course there's some videos from dc10 um which look really interesting in terms of the difference in people that go to these sort of events um that's one of the only things i think i'm not really a fan of like the segregation when it comes to dance and electronic music because everyone i'm gonna go visit or the people that I'd go, i'm gonna go hang out with in berlin when i eventually go they're the type of people who don't think these people are cool right they kind of look down on them there's a kind of there's a weird kind of like raving hierarchy because you go to fold or something or because you go to the course or because you go to grease Mueller or because you go to else or you go to a flipping um party that cobosio is playing at or you go to a conceptual or you go to a crossbreed um 
uh, or you go to Heran, how you pronounce that word, right? Those are kind of seen as way cooler than going to like a night in Cafe 1001 or the Village Underground or that kind of stuff. And I don't really understand why, because this is still the same sort of avenue, I'd say the same sort of platform or the same sort of arena or sector that would make people more open-minded and just kind of, um, what do you say, called open-minded and receptive to people from different walks of life and different sort of interest. Yes, don't get me wrong, the crowd is a little bit, basic bitchy and maybe a little bit normy but still the fact that these people go out to these sort of events nightclubs and go to follow their favorite dj have a little bit of a dance maybe do a couple of bumps in the toilet drink some drinks you know have you know hug some strangers and hang out it's still a good thing it's still something that we should kind of celebrate regardless of whether or not <laughs> some people from some white converses have been after dc10 what does this guy say it's kind of funny after dc10 over and out <laughs> that's hilarious but yeah um I still think it's a good thing. Yeah, you know I mean, I still think that we are all part of the same kind of. What would you say? We're all part of the same eco ecosystem, world, love, whatever it may be. Right? We're all part of the same thing. So I think we should probably be a little bit more forgiving and loving of each other when it comes to these sort of things. But it is interesting the difference in the people that go to these kind of events vis a vis the people the places that I go, and just the fact that everyone we've all got our dress sense, right? in the techno clubs i go to everybody is dressed in all black um everybody basically looks like they haven't washed everybody is either shaking or you know vibrating for the beats or from doing too much speed and too much cat too much coke or too much ghb in the in the cases of some of the places i go to right um everyone's wearing a pair of double stacked new dr martins or new rock boots or something else wherever and in these sort of venues you've got girls that look like this right they wear these really interestingly slinky kind of cocktail outfits what's that deep drink is that water in a cardboard box oh, interesting right these girls wear these kind of slinky cocktail hour dresses and they go to these kind of venues right usually from what i've seen the girls look far better than the boys they make far more effort in terms of their outfits the lads usually have a kind of variation of this kind of boy outfit on right it's usually this sort of jean jean shorts with the you know with these jordan ones tied way way too tight um you know that kind of vibe or it's the kind of really flowery shirt with the jean shorts like that like the kind of funky shirt with the jean shorts on but yeah from what i've read everyone's look at look at look at imagine seeing a, a group of girls at this the clubs that i go to it doesn't it doesn't exist right they're all very clean um very well manicured very well height very well what's that thing called um trimmed and all that stuff you know it, as gross as that may sound but you know what i mean but so far I've read reports that people have been waiting. Oh yeah, this is um, DC10 water. I've read reports people have been waiting up to four hours to get in. Um, so it looks like queues exist everywhere from Bergheim to DC10. Um, all the major places that people like to go to have got really long queues. I think the production of it is really nice though. And all the red lights and shit it looks absolutely amazing. You're kind of being transported to another, to kind of an alternative world. But yeah, look at the queues, man. Look at how insane the fucking queues are at DC10. Absolutely nutty. That looks like a... You know what that looks like? That looks like when a plane emergency lands somewhere and you have to kind of get off on the tarmac and then kind of walk to the airport. Do you know what I mean? That's what it looks like. Or, do you know what I mean? Absolutely wild how long those queues are. And people are willingly waiting. And of course, once they get on the dance floor, they are shaking, dancing. But again, the use of the phones, man, like that's something that you don't see in any of the clubs that I usually go to. Number one, because people are too cool and they don't want to look like they're too extended. It's their first time. And also in some of the places I go to, especially in Berlin, they kind of cover your phone with a sticker so you can't take pictures. So you kind of have to allow yourself to just enjoy the environment and not be too, you know, caught up in recording things so you can share your friends, show your friends and shit, which is always a bit cringe anyway, right? Sharing your friends' pictures of the holidays that they didn't go to. It's just like, you know, just describe it over two minutes and just keep it moving. This is a video of girls walking in the entrance to see what this looks like. They've got like a ton of things. That's quite cool. I like this installation they've got. They're, they're really cool. They're really um clever about what they do in terms of creating little spaces and spots where people can do cool little things for their Instagram, in it? Because people might immediately tag them. You know, you've got this kid here waiting until the end to take this great picture, which is always good, right? Because you're the last man or woman on the dance floor. Everyone knows that you kind of, you know, you made it all the way to the end. I was the same group big group of people i don't know how people do this man honestly my friendship my friend group now why do they have a friend group this big and number two it'd be near or impossible to get all these people to agree on a set time to go out i don't have it like it doesn't happen in my friendship group. i don't know maybe you guys do but i definitely don't have a friendship group that would uh, would allow for that many people to go out at the same time but it looks rather interesting i'm not going to lie second look is rather interesting so it's open at the moment everyone's of course has seemed to having fun clubbing has come back in some way shape or form 
um yeah so you know looking forward to the next chapter as we go along but yeah look at the difference in terms of the ladies that go to these places man it's really incredible isn't it it's really really interesting that they'd be i wonder what even attracts girls like this to go to these sort of events is it just or maybe if you to be honest if you're a girl that looks like this right it's just an excuse to look sexy isn't it because you don't really get a chance to look hot and wear outfits like this if you're not going out to a club, where else are you going to wear an outfit like that? Do you know what I mean? Not to a restaurant. Do you know what I mean? So maybe that's the reason. But I wonder why. I wonder if, I wonder if, because again, not, not to be mean, but I wouldn't imagine like a lot of girls are really into what Seth Troxler looks like, especially now. Do you know what I mean? He's, you know, he's piled on the pounds. He doesn't look like he really takes care of himself too much. Or maybe the Michael Bibbies and lot are, the, are like really hot boys and girls really fancy them. I'm not too sure, but I wonder what kind of brings. Okay, she's been there, there with a fella, but I wonder what kind of what what would bring a girl that looks like this to these sort of events? Because you know, in terms of the lads that go there, there's not much for them to choose from, really, in it. Like, you no, know, to be honest, look at them. The guys don't look the best, right? There's not like a, you know, I don't think anyone's falling over themselves to go meet. Uh, you know, this assortment of lads here, right? Savidor. And his friends i don't think people are really falling over themselves to meet them but for whatever reason they all do go out there's a real real big contingency of them i think it'd be about 50 50 split again it's a shame the lineup wise oh look at those pants those velvet pink pants in the background interesting it's just a shame that the lineups aren't as interesting as the crowd right there should be a lot more girls playing in these sort of places but again maybe they don't want to play they want to hang out in the crowds again there's a michael baby taking a picture of the fan but yeah, interesting people in it that go to these events. And again, uh, it's just a shame that it's, it's so segregated. That's the guy that does um, Circo Loco, right? The one that's friends with um, Ricardo Tishi. I don't know his name. But everyone's obviously getting a picture of him smiling and shit. Probably the team. Probably took him a lot of time to get this organized, isn't it? Bloody hell, man. Bloody hell. But yeah, big up everybody. Hopefully you guys had fun over there, out there. Oh, immediately lens on the dance floor, taking pictures with fans. Boo. Dead out um again everyone's having a good time you know that face and that we've all been there you know that face too we've all been there pictures with seth Troxler having a great whale of a time you've got loco dice there yeah cool man looks it looks fun not gonna lie it looks fun everyone queuing up having a good time it looks fun i would i wouldn't mind going it's definitely not the, my kind of music don't get me wrong especially this version of tech house it's just a bit shit i preferred the old version of tech house or well, no the older version of tech house the early you know the kind of when it started to meld into kind of minimal right that was what i kind of preferred or even going back further than that but um whatever this version of tech house is just a little bit reductive i listen to some of those michael booby sets and they're really hit and miss in terms of their overall appeal like look at the difference in people it's just interesting isn't it right there's nothing linking people that look like that and people that look like this right apart from the vibes that's why again that's why i say it's so cool these kind of events in some regard because they, they look like they should be in more of a you know bergheiny type venue and this guy looks like he should be at dc10 right they, they kind of suit a bit more in that regard but yeah cool look even people bring out bring out their kids with them because obviously i'd be for a lot of people live there and shit so that's pretty cool to see oh cute little baby there but yeah man cool vibes it looks like cool vibes anyway move on from that one what's we going to talk about here uh what's this yeah this is interesting but again this is something i think most people have known about and again it's not really interesting news because it's not to be honest but i just saw it across my timeline recently and it is quite cute so i thought i'd celebrate it in some way shape or form especially as being as i'm a fan of um a lot of the stand-up comedy podcasts that you know reside around la and new york area and that whole kind of um uh weird little world that exists over there so it looks like um joy coy and flipping um chelsea handler are a couple now i never knew that i never knew they even knew each other well i guess i should have known because joy coy used to write or is writing still on the chelsea handler show but from all intents and purposes they've been long time friends they probably maybe fancied each other um for a long time behind the scenes maybe it never really quite worked out in terms of each person being single at the same time but whatever it's kind of the stars have aligned and now they've kind of come out officially on their social media and declared their relationship which is you know cool because you know joey coy is a really funny dude um you, you know the way he kind of carries himself he's quite a charismatic guy so i'd assume he didn't really struggle with attracting the ladies especially on the road and chelsea handler is chelsea handler in it she's basically uh she has a lot of kind of alpha male energy in terms of how she approaches men so again i'm not sure i'm definitely convinced she doesn't really struggle to find a mate either so the fact that they've kind of decided to be in a relationship together knowing you know they've both probably had a very um 
what's that what's that thing with the said they've probably got a very high body count each of them right the fact that they've decided at this moment is probably um evidence that they're both ready to settle down in some way shape or form and just just from observing side of it on the outside again not knowing these people and just kind of seeing it and being a fan of joy i mean uh of, of joy Coy on podcasts and stuff and how he kind of carries himself it's just cool to see a somewhat celebrity couple be of age if that makes any kind of sense, right? Especially on the dude side of things, because you know, dudes basically get the added advantage of being able to impregnate women until the day they die. And they also get the advantage if they've got money and they've got fame to basically have the pick of the litter, right? They can choose anybody they want to kind of, you know, be their long time companion. Um and sometimes guys have the tendency to kind of go for the younger girl. Um, because why not? Especially if you're rich and famous, you know, if you're able to attract girls who are from the ages of like eighteen and twenty six, why wouldn't you do that legitimately? I definitely understand stand but from what i've seen um from joe budden who i used to listen to his podcast a lot you know at stop now since the kind of fallout he had with rory and mal but i've really noticed some really kind of bad and worrying traits with people especially guys who tend to date women excessively younger than or who happen to be way younger than they are especially maturity in life and whatnot you get spun in this kind of constant circle where you start to believe that girls that age represent women in general which they obviously don't and especially if you're a joe budden kind of guy he usually dates a certain type of woman a certain type of age and from a certain type of industry so you're naturally going to run into the same type of issues but for whatever reason that kind of young um punan is so intoxicating he can't pull away from it right so he keeps getting himself involved in you know relationship after hookup after relationship after date after relationship with the same type of person the same type of issues happen and he keeps complaining about them which you know maybe he's not complaining because he's actually upset maybe it just makes for a good story but i just couldn't imagine myself being the age that joe budden is which is what early 40s and dating somebody who's like under 28 do you know what i mean it just wouldn't make any sense in my head i don't even know what we'd have to talk about right it's bad enough having to talk to my brother's little friends right and then having them kind of annoy you with some of their nonsense that they talk about imagine having to be in a relationship with another woman or with a girl who you're kind of with a lot of the times having to kind of make small talk with and she's legitimately talking about stuff that you have no idea about the references are all off life experiences don't really make sense and you're not really in the same walk of life of where you're going it's just a bit strange so it's quite nice to see people of age of a similar age dating and it's obviously good to see people who are super successful in their own right deciding that you know they both want to date each other in that regard too because sometimes they say i think especially from a woman's side especially if you're a chelsea handler and you're like an a-type woman and you're super successful you got your own money you've done your own thing it's probably difficult to find dudes that are willing to kind of settle down with you because they're always going to kind of find because they're kind of going to feel somewhat inferior so maybe it is beneficial that joy did um that Joe Coy did been, um, obviously work under her in some regard on the Chester Anders show. He's also got his own career. He also seems like somebody that doesn't have, you know, doesn't suffer, falls gladly, isn't, uh, doesn't have like self confidence issues, wouldn't feel a bit amiss if people refer to him as Chelsea Handler's husband or whatever. Do you know what I mean? All that kind of vibe. So I think it's going to be perfect for them going forward. But yeah, big up them. They uploaded a little, you know, pictures of them on dates and shit. It says it feels so good to have love and laughter and joy in my life. So again, happy, um, what do you call it, get together or whatever. What what they called? Happy coming out relationship to these guys. They've got a podcast I did together where they kind of detail how the relationship happened or whatnot. I'm sure is interesting but i didn't have ever listened to it i'm not going to listen to it to be honest i'm just going to judge the pictures but yeah i think they make for a cute couple again it's good to see people of the similar age dating each other for a change i'm sure joy joey could have gone for whoever he wanted in terms of age range and whatnot he didn't i'm sure chelsea could have gone forever she wanted two in terms of age and they didn't two two people who are beast in terms of their own career decide to hook up and i think it's a good thing to see refreshingly you know because you get to see flipping you know people are flipping brian kellen and that joe i mean leaving his missus and you know his children and hacking up with somebody i think more than half his age is like i don't know man i don't get again i don't get it i think it's a certain dude that likes that kind of thing but i don't get it oh look she have to comment as well under the picture chess handler said oh babe you are laughter and joy i'm just vibing off of you and why is budget highlighting vibing isn't vibing a world fuck i just looked it up i'm vibing jesus man it's mad isn't it she's like probably in love and this is really it's kind of cringe but also really endearing um to see this i'm not going to lie again i'm not really sure about church and relationship status i don't know if she had many um relationships prior to him or she was married or whatnot i don't really know um not really that interesting i know joe has a kid already um who's pretty older i'm pretty sure he's got an older kid right yeah that's the one there with the curly hair um but yeah man they're going out they're having a good time they're vibing they're having they're having fun they're even recording what's this is this is an instagram uh igtv 
They've got a little IGTV they recorded here together as a couple. Look at that coming out video. People are congratulating them in the comments and really liking it. Oh, y'all just don't sound happy some of us are oh, together. Chelsea lately was a great show. We've seen Joe live, uh, Joe live in Phoenix. I love Koi. I love Choi. Okay, that's what they're calling it, Choi, as in a group, as in a couple name, right? What's that? From there your toe, because your toe always gets sore after sex. All right. Oh, Buddha, 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 baby. <laughs> I love my baby. <laughs> Wow, man. The way, the way, especially the way I've heard other podcasters describe Chelsea Handler, you would never, you've never seen this side of her, innit? Where she's like in love and lovey dubby and soppy and shit, right? Because you always kind of hear of her. Again, maybe it's the industry she works in too. She has to maybe present a more masculine, tough edge because she's, again, working in a dude's industry with loads of predatory dudes and she's a attractive blonde lady. So for sure, she had to kind of, you know, withstand a lot of uh, her. Un, un, kind of, un, yeah, undesirable advances, right? Or advances that she didn't request in any way, shape, or form. So she kind of had to create like a tough exterior. Because I remember, I think Joe Diaz saying a story where he kind of didn't necessarily have the best experience of her. Because I think he tried to make a joke and she didn't really take it too well. And ever since then, he thinks he's kind of convinced that she hates him, which I imagine she probably would do. You know, I don't imagine she'd be, kind of be a fan of the Joey Diaz's and the Burt Crashes of this world, and I wouldn't imagine. But you know, you never know. But yeah, big up them. Um, they make for a cute couple, Joe Coy and Chelsea Handler. Um, love to see it. Love to see it. Moving on here. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, my ear is kind of vibing off of this thing, isn't it? It's definitely vibing. Oh, we have this. Um, congratulations, I guess, to a Cold War for their collaboration with a Beats. They've got a pair of Studio Free wireless headphones coming out, um, adorned with the sort of signature a Cold War industrial slate speckled kind of pattern print all over the absolute headphones himself. Obviously, you've got a cool picture here of Samuel Ross, the founder of a Cold War, wearing them, looking all serious and austere. Um, I'm a big fan of the brand. I'm a big fan of him. I think he's a really cool, interesting, and very remarkable young man in terms of how much how he's been able to create this brand from the ground up. Especially when you consider the humble beginnings of kind of spray painting and dip dyeing Air Force Ones and cutting up bits of fabric and overlocking it and whatnot, and having exposed seams to. I'm just really DIY hands-on kind of stuff, and now it's gone from that to turning into what I think is basically the UK's version of like Imperial Armani, right? That's how kind of powerful and big I think this brand could be. It could end up being a brand that he kind of maybe later on down the line sells and just kind of kind of or maybe operates from or operates in the backgrounds or in the shadows. So it's very impressive in that regard. But he does have this weird thing where he pulls these weird faces. He's always like frowning or doing his weird like you know eyebrow things when he's filming videos and whatnot online or taking pictures but you know i guess everyone's got their thing when it comes to taking pictures drake has that little duck thing lips he does he's got that weird eyebrow thing maybe i have that weird little open mouth thing where i kind of take a picture from down below but yeah i think the picture itself is fucking cool all that thing regardless so yeah a beat studio free wireless set of headphones um look pretty cool on his head especially with all the tattoos and shit um, I like it. I like everything about it. Again, just a shame it's a Beats headphones, you know what I mean? Because they're pretty garbage. But um, in terms of a collaboration and in terms of the brand story and in terms of where they're going, this definitely represents a step in the right direction in terms of kind of introducing uh, a cold war to the maybe general consumer, um, to the mainstream, quote unquote. And again, like I said, I have no doubt that it will be as big, if not bigger than brands like Armani in terms of the scale and the kind of product offering and the customer. Because I think a lot of the customers that kind of bought a cold war early on are maturing and growing with the brand over the years. And when they start offering different things, different silhouettes, different cuts, different shapes, different textures, different patterns, um, you know, I'm sure they will kind of progress with them as well and go along the journey. And again, because this guy, Simon Ross, is really interactive. He's really kind of thoughtful. Um, there's a lot of kind of, again, um, ideas and attention to detail that goes into the entirety of the brand. I'm sure it's going to be a success. Um, let's see what Simon Ross has to say about the collaboration himself. He said here, courtesy of Hypebeast, um, the focus of our Beats, a Cold War collaboration, was to convey a universal material language that is both sensitive and recognisable to all, ensuring a minimalistic sensibility carried through the process. He does have a, also a tendency to do these word salads. Again, I don't begrudge it because, you know, he's an artist, he's a creative. He has to kind of speak in these kind of... Um, 
he basically has to speak like this in order to, to convey in order to basically because yeah because how else can you talk about creativity how else can you talk about innovation how else can you talk about art in general without using these words salady words right because in general you are talking about things that are quite ephemeral they're quite hard to you know um grasp or to kind of put in layman's language for lack of a better term but you know whatever it continues i want to produce a product language suitable for everyday use precision and specifically uh and specificity became unspoken rules throughout the process from product to packaging um, new print making techniques were developed with beats to offer a two-tone uh, pantia composed of slate grays and washed chalks the semblance of both offer and texture um hand touch that reflects the sensation the sensation of a hand engaged in raw materials and for manufactured materials a sensory experience had exist had to exist across physical touch and alongside autist uh, uh, acoustic autistic um I'm, I'm autistic you know what would be you know what's true though about this as well they are very unique looking for a beat set of headphones or maybe headphones in general you don't really see people going down the street with like a slate speckled set of headphones right the branding is really cool too and especially for the beat shape you're definitely going to recognize them right they're going to they're going to stand out like a sore thumb from afar and also you know what would have been awesome to see if they were able to do some sort of like daniel arsham type collaboration where they were able to maybe cast a set of beats by again maybe that would have been a bit naff a little bit you know overdone because it looks like daniel arsham has basically moved away from doing all those kind of concrete casting type of sculpture things that he does that kind of deteriorate over time or as you keep moving and bits of the actual piece fall off and you know it kind of you know um changes the representation of what it actually looks like or what it basically says so maybe that would have been a bit trite or a little bit overdone but it would have been nice to have seen an actual slate concrete set of headphones constructed maybe with like a wire frame or structure inside them to kind of keep the shape or something like those kind of i think that would have been really great to see but regardless we moved on building a literal link between the environment inspiration material function enable us to project um to enable us to project shared hyper local hyper global influences as a keystone for a universal community by this i mean through cinematography the shifting of the environments and location the catalyst of music playing a major one transporting a listener or transforming a physical environment a cold war beats um, studio free wireless re released on october 15th for cold war channels before hitting the apple store web store wow they're even gonna be sold at apple mate this is a big move for them man congratulations and if i'm not mistaken they've got like an advert or like a little pitch um i think the official advert has got um little dirk in it and he's wearing a cold war um what you call it vest body warmer vest thing as well in the shot it's fucking awesome um so check that out as well if you haven't seen it, i'm pretty sure it's on their instagram account but yeah this was going to be available on october 15th big up them i like the look of them they look pretty interesting again just a shame it's beats because the quality of the headphones isn't that great um sound is a bit shit especially once you get into headphones and you get into being a bit of an audio file or you tap into that kind of community you'll quickly realize how terrible the headphones are but in terms of a stylistic approach in terms of a branding effort in terms of a marketplace thing um they could have this is definitely a great fit 100 percent a great fit for what they want to do going forward i love it like that's an awesome shot in it really awesome shot with the grays and the contrast here the tattoos looks fucking awesome so yeah big up them big up them next on the list what else yeah we talk about this i want to give a quick shout out to supreme as i always do on this channel supreme or on the sorry on this channel on this podcast specifically supreme has definitely would have been one of the main catalysts or inspirations behind why i'm interested in fashion or in clothes in general supreme bape and probably hiroshi fujiwara and maybe people like aaron bondaroff kind of got me interested in this thing that we call culture or whatever it may be that we're in at the moment and supreme in general going forward you know there's a lot of hits and misses they're currently growing probably a little bit too quick for my liking the, the recent investment probably spells the end of the brand the fact that they're opening loads of stores spells the end they've got the one opening in milan there's rumors about a berlin one opening very soon it, it quite quickly is kind of changing in front of my eyes and kind of steering away from the supreme i knew and love but at the essence at the core they still remain the same that's something that you can't say for a lot of brands especially with their kind of history in the game 20 plus years it's very difficult to kind of somehow keep a customer like myself who came around what a year 18 or something i mean it's very difficult to keep that customer still along the line you know it's basically a brand um kind of built off the back of youth culture so it's no surprise that the kids coming up now would resonate to it more than i would 
obviously because I'm older. But the one thing I have to give them credit for, and I've said it on social, and I definitely want to repeat on here, is their collaborations, especially when it comes to collaborating with Nike. They always, always go for the very unconventional model. And again, I don't know why this is. I don't know if it's like a specific thing that Nike only do with Supreme, or if it's a thing of Supreme get the Carte Blanche to go into the Nike archives and basically pick whatever model they want to basically retro or to bring back to life or to reintroduce or to have as an offering i don't know what way it works but whatever the the however they get that decision i really do give them a lot of credit for always sticking to their guns and just going for unconventional models not the easy thing because the easy thing could be to go for whatever air max that people are into whatever air force one people are into which they have done a few don't get me wrong but still not as many as they probably could have gotten away with um whatever kind of Jordan they could get away with to, to doing in the future, right? They could easily max out and make money and just make money hand over fist if they did a collaboration of one, threes, fours, and fives, right? Even sixes. They could easily just release a set, a pair of those every single season and they'll sell out, you know, without even blinking an eyelid. But the fact that they go for models like this, which is the recent one featured, a Supreme Nike and Cross Trainer Low, probably I reckon maybe one of their most i reckon it's going to be one of the most unpopular in terms of models because i remember i remember myself buying a pair of supreme tws that they did years ago that came out in red black white and blue if i remember if, if i'm not mistaken they were they weren't the most popular in terms of um, resale value or in terms of selling out but i loved them i wore them i wore them to death because at the time i had the og tws as well um but i again i'm a big fan of the trainers in general for me to represent the pinnacle of kind of nike cross training design um they're kind of the perfect gym shoe i've got a pair that were in the gym medicine balls the the kind of uh, the the, tr the air trainer freeze i love the look of it i like i love how they you know the kind of vintage old school gym look that they have it kind of reminds you of the Andre Agassi days you know but again it's not a very popular model nowadays right it's not something that you would see a lot of the kids in your kind of metropolitan city that go and buy limited edition shit wearing day to day they don't wear GRs of you know air train lows so the fact that Supreme went ahead and did this you have to give them props because again the easier option could be just to go and just do the same tied collaborations that they always do and then just kind of cashing the money that way but for them to do this collaboration I love this probably my favorite color it kind of looks like a Gucci color Color way that they always do they've kind of got this in their staple i've got a couple of bags with some sort of, sort of color with the black red and green um but yeah really really cool collaboration really interesting model really interesting colorway and application and again just something fresh to kind of you know um um, steer away from the drudgery and the repetitiveness of some of the other color labs that exist out there the new balances everyone's doing the same model the air force ones are the same model yeah max is the same model at least with them they try to do new and fresh things like i mentioned the other day with patter the new air max one don't get me wrong it's a kind of a boring model but they do do it in a fresh way they've got that wavy mud guard they switched up the kind of materialing and the color of the mesh you saw that weird silvery um mesh thing they've got in the toe box that makes it look like something you would have bought in the early 90s or whatnot so i love the approach of it and again it's just one colorway they could have easily done three or four they've just done one colorway that's it one special box for tier zero normal box for the other ones and then that's it put it out but this is great like even this colorway this white red and you know the, the color combo you don't really see that often um again there's no all blacks there's no all whites like it's it's really cool i love all everything about it again it's not gonna be very popular i think with a lot of people um i'm sure of it but i definitely like the approach this reminds me a little bit of that flag um that david hammond uses in his collaborations um also in these pieces of art uh, i think it's like a flag for african americans if i'm not mistaken um so that definitely reminds me of that i'm not sure what that actually reminds me of but again two core really interesting colorways i think they're due to come out this thursday if i'm not mistaken let me double check but yeah big up supreme anyway for always doing the best and going for things unconventional so it says here um supreme i've worked with nike on a new version of the cross trainer low for fall 2020 fall 2021 so again i'm not too sure if this is them because usually when it comes to collaborations i'm not sure you guys are aware usually when you collaborate with a brand they're either trying to you know um clout chase with your audience or they want to reintroduce a model that there's been basically laying dormant to like a new audience right and obviously use your audience too as a way to kind of you know push that thing and your legitimacy as a brand to kind of you know stamp its approvals people can be like oh yeah it's a brain dead collaboration oh yeah it's a supreme collaboration and kind of want to buy it 
But sometimes if you're a big enough brand, you can go to them and say, I want to do another Air Force One. I want to do this. I want to do that. Do you know what I mean? Or they just offer you the flipping archive and say, pick what you want. So I wonder what it is. Maybe somewhere in between. The shoe features a premium leather upper with perforated leather toe. They, and again, they have the best product descriptions. I don't know why. I love Supreme product descriptions. I love how they describe stuff. They, they describe stuff. Snap button, front closure, zip closure. I love it. Um, the dazzle, um, dazzle mesh tongue. Um, heel panels, Dura plush leather, Dura, Dura plush tongue, heel lining, rubber outsole with lugs and flex grooves, co-branded footbed, raised logo on the tongue and deboss and embroidered logo on the heel. Look at that product description. It's beautiful, doesn't it? Made exclusively for Supreme. The cross chain low will be offered in two colorways available October 14th in, you know, everywhere, um, everywhere and then available in Japan October 16th. So yeah, check those out, man. I'm again a big fan of them. This is what sneaker culture is actually about. What sneaker culture was about back in the day was buying models like this, right? And then making it look cool. Models that people probably overlooked or didn't like. That's what you did. You went out of your way to do that instead of buying the obvious bait thing that everyone's wearing. But you know, people nowadays aren't necessarily that receptive to taking many risks when it comes to the stuff that they buy, which is understandable considering the time we live in. But I just wish people would be a little bit more adventurous with those kind of things and then to talk about adventures and to keep on going about that we've got these collaborations which are due to come out i think on the thursday too so it's going to be a jam-packed week for shoes you've got the supreme obviously trainer lows i mentioned you've got the pata and air max uh pata and nike air max ones with the wavy um mud guard um which are flipping awesome and then you've got the jound and new balances um which are absolutely banging i kind of didn't really pay much attention to him before because maybe I didn't see any more detailed product shots. But now that we've seen the actual product shots for real and we've seen them modeled, um, they are really special. And again, they're really special in the way that I think I mentioned it beforehand that I love that nowadays when it comes to sneaker collaborations, because maybe there's so many brands you can collaborate with generally, right? Gen genuinely, sorry. And the customer base or the audience isn't only isn't kind of demanding you because before i felt like if you're a brand coming up right you didn't stand a chance of selling a shoe if it wasn't a collaboration with nike or adidas but now it feels like fans or consumers are more receptive to you as a brand deciding to you know rock you know kind of collaborate with flipping puma carry more um, sukorni essex right as long as it fit your kind of brand and what you're trying to do and kind of gives you the ability to kind of showcase um more creative kind of interpretations of sneaker design like what kiko does with essex and shit right now he's got his own little imprint that he kind of designs under as well with his team and um, people are going to gobble it up because they, they know that's their best version of your artistic expression on the shoe instead of you just maybe changing a couple of panel colorways on an, Air, on an Air Force One or something, right? And because of that, it's led to a lot more interesting collaborations because there's a lot less pressure on that one shoe. So you're not having to just spunk all your ideas on it and it ends up looking like some flipping what the dunk, year of the dog sort of kind of hybrid, right? Which is awful. It's like loads of colors, loads of textures just for the sake of it. And pony hair everywhere. Remember at the time, everyone was doing pony horse hair. Everyone was doing suede like it's just too much right now people are because the coverage are so plentiful you can take a little bit more of a subtle a little bit more of um brand pacific a little bit more of a uh something that kind of lends your design codes all well, that kind of good stuff and a good example of it is this new balance and jound 990 version 4 in navy at first when the pictures leaked it looked like it was all black but now that i know that it's a really dark pigment or you know basically of a navy or dark shade of navy it looks even better especially with the models especially with the you know with the outfits that they're wearing just absolutely brilliant so this is courtesy of new balances um sorry jound it says new balance jound um 990 version 4 in navy in 98 new balance release a radical sneaker the objective was ambitious making the best running shoe in the world the 990 gained immediate critical acclaim upon its release today the shoe is thoughtfully re-engineered designed minimalist minimal aesthetic and gimmick free comfort continue to strike across generations remaining inconstantably sorry relevant in the here and now of sneaker culture the 99 version the 990 version 4 silhouettes most recent iteration is the realization of the over three and a half decades of development still implementing new balances um owner jim davis's original brief to craft a sneaker that stands out as a very best of its kind formally released in 2016 um to, to our 2016 
the version 4 keeps the original iconic shape and treatment with the introduction of a redesigned soul unit and minor updates on the upper pattern. The collaboration is crafted in tonal nubuck with mesh construction. That's what you like to hear, nubuck. The the best thing, the, the, the only better thing than suede is nubuck, right? Especially when it kind of wears in and stuff. It just looks beautiful. Um, featuring a textured contrast that highlights the silhouettes, nuanced colorways, subtle 3M detail, is reflective secondary laces, and a custom logo molded toggle enhance a vertical style functionality that is core to the sneakers original identity they're going to be available to purchase for 265 dollars though it's a lot of money mate on jown.com on thursday and october for october 14th 12 p.m est i'm assuming that's where they're only going to be able to be ordered so you can have to be quick on those bots to get them but the model pictures are just brilliant absolutely brilliant they really kind of bring them to life i saw these pictures of these guys it looks like somewhere in the depths of paris they look like they're on a set of gomorrah or something right um the fact that they were expertly cast loads of dark skinned dudes wearing navy and i think he's wearing a black um all um outfit there i think that might be a jowned collaboration i'm sorry a jowned outfit too if i'm not mistaken is absolutely epic they look so 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 good um, obviously, the pictures of the New Balances stacked in a, some luggage, similar to what you'd find, you know, bricks of cocaine loaded in there as well for their, you know, cross European travels. Again, a couple of lads eating burgers, hanging out, wearing a pair of trainers, you know, just doing the vibe with a little side. Just effortless, ep 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 epic. Who did the photography? Um, the Jebby Kebby and the casting, Bien Vienu. And maybe that's in house John thing. I'm not too sure. Styling assistant, Shine Ka What's that? Shin. Sheen Kalanas Kalasans Kalasans Sheen is Kalasans and all the models are listed too but yeah look how beautiful these look man absolutely gorgeous like that's a great way to do an all black shoe right instead of doing an all black shoe doing all navy upper with some black detailings and stuff and obviously all black outsole and you've got this amazing iteration I wonder if that's like a, you know what to remind me of who's that guy um that guy that did the color, the pigment that was the blackest of blacks. I forgot his name. And it's Anish Kapoor, right? He did the blackest of blacks. But this pigment of this blue is similar. And it also reminds me of what was that tribe of people in Africa? Um, maybe it's Northern Africa who are like, they have a pigment skin color. It's beautiful. It's sort of so dark that it kind of looks a little bit purpley, bluish sort of color. So it reminds me of that. Maybe that's why the models look so good as well. And again, the lacing. This is another kind of thing I wanted to say about shoes when they kind of do product shots. Why don't people do correct lacing? If you're not going to do lacing like this, at least make them look like they've been worn. Those This, this set of lacing just makes them look wearable instantly you can imagine what they're gonna look like with your outfit like and it, it doesn't take much effort but john's product shots when it comes to shoes are otherworldly they, they even made me consider buying those rebooks they were fucking terrible the rebooks that they did but they considered i really ha was debating getting them because of the product shots were so well done with this crisp white background how they put together the lacing just really 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 well done it's a shame you can't just go next to the pictures in it right but yeah the pictures are awesome um, got a nice little logo here. I mean, sorry, the the, um, the label New Balance made in uh, made in the USA. I wonder if this is another um, thing that's been under done under the stewardship of the new guy. Is it Emily and Dio who's kind of heading up the New Balance USA office? Whether this is just like a long term relationship they had prior to him joining. Again, you got a nice little jound emblem there. You got jound on the insole really subtly done but you know for the heads that know they know like if you there's a thing if you if you're about this life when you see someone wearing a pair of these you'll know from afar you won't need to be told a little perforate heel there maybe that's where the 3m is right this little perforation here on the back i can maybe see the 3m is it 3m on this on the actual logo itself maybe i'm not too sure maybe it's just the heel looks like the heel is just the 3m bit and then the black as well look at that oh it's gorgeous and you got some tonal laces there um, sorry, some laces that you can obviously pull tie like similar to like a Solomon, right? With the John blending on there, embossed. Absolutely beautiful. Again, due to come out um, October 14th, 265 USD, um, 12 p.m. EST. You're probably going to cry and have tears because you're not going to be able to purchase them. But if you are, congratulations. Definitely maybe one of the better, van, better vans, better new balances I've seen this year. Um, again, definitely a reminder that there's other brands out there you should be buying instead of Nike that aren't just a standard bullshit. And also another example of sometimes when you do a collaboration for a sneaker, it doesn't have to have a million different colorways featured on it. You can just do the subtlest of things and still be able to create a compelling enough product that people are going to be willing to queue up online to purchase but yeah absolutely beautiful absolutely beautiful 
anyway let's move on i think that might be it you know for now don't want to waste too much more of your time i think i've speaking for an hour already ever and i'm pretty much sure i have let's check the time here oh yeah it's been an hour 20 minutes actually thank you so much anyway hour 20 minutes leave it there for now don't want to waste too much more of your time um it's been a pleasure to have your company it's been a continuing show episode number 506 as per usual if you're the first time check out the show on youtube make sure you smash the like button here subscribe leave a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app please give me a five four three two one star review i'd be greatly appreciated and of course if you are listening and you want to subscribe to the patreon and support me then make sure you do at patreon.com for agostino i have bonus content there coming soon i'm also recording a mix um of the test miss episode number 58 57 was a bit shit because my camera failed um I, I kind of tried to be smart and take my iphone and record something a little bit more clear the quality went absolutely berserk and it didn't really work for some reason the link on the program so it's all jittery the sound is perfect i'm going to upload it onto soundcloud later if you want to listen to the mp3 do so but the mix itself is still available now for a short period of time probably unlisted because you know the quality is so terrible but i'm going to redo another one as well live on friday so make sure you tune in it's going to be available on my youtube channel if you're watching you know where it is at but if you're not if you're listening on the podcast i'll link it in the description for you to check out yourself but until then i'll see you guys very soon take care be safe peace